Can you hear me okay? My voice is dropping. You hear me okay? Yeah. Keep this up, right? Yeah. Yeah, keep it up. Okay, so flag me if I start dropping my... not throw rotten tomatoes, only fresh ones. <laughs> they go good in salad. Psalm 105. We're familiar with this. We had this in the last series I did of the Millennial Kingdom as we looked at the life of Joseph. I hope you remember some of these things. Perhaps you reviewed it on your own because it's such a precious story in the Word of that is yet to be completely fulfilled. So Psalm 105, just a portion of this concerning Joseph, but there's a principle here I want to look at today which I did not cover the last time. And it is uh, uh, verse 16. Are you with me? Psalm 105, verse 16. Moreover, he called for a famine upon the land. It wasn't just Egypt. It was the whole uh, Medio Oriente, the whole Middle Eastern area there. Is Israel, Syria, what's, what's now Syria, Lebanon, and uh, Israel, Jordan, the whole area, as well as Egypt and part of Saudi Arabia. That whole area was affected by this drought, uh, which lasted for seven years. He, it says, he called for a famine upon the land. He break the whole staff of bread. What does that mean? One word, famine. Famine. Okay, that's, that's what it means. Um, he sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. Now think about this. He, to change all of this and to bring to pass what his will was for his people, he used one man. Now, of course, that's a picture of Christ. Jesus Christ. One man. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be justified in due time. One man who was sold for service was Jesus humbled himself, I've already been teaching on that. He humbled himself to come on a form of servant, a man, whose feet they hurt in fetters. He was laid in iron. He was put in prison for something he didn't do and punished severely for it. Does that remind you of somebody? Yeah. See how wonderful this is? And this is happening. Seventeen hundred seventeen. We're looking at almost two thousand years before Jesus was born. Fifteen hundred years of Moses, and then this is almost four hundred years before. So think about it. One day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. The Lord is coming. That's the message in all the Scripture. He's coming. Amen. All right. He's coming to reign on earth. So the time it says here, whose feet they hurt with fetters, he was laid in iron until, verse 19, the time that his word came. What does that mean? What do you think it means? Talking about Joseph, until the time that his word came. Now, this could be referring to God's word for Joseph. Okay, that's one, one uh, possible way to see it. And the other word is that the word simply concerning Joseph, his life. What's he here? What are we here for? God has a purpose in our lives. We pray about doing the will of God, right? But it more, it's more than that. It's his divine purpose that he's going to fulfill, and no one can stop him from doing that, even if we decline, even if we opt out, which we may. He's, it's going to be, his purposes will be accomplished. Because he's the sovereign Lord. So we don't have a choice about that. We have a choice about serving him, whether we're in or out. 
whether we're faithful or not, whether we obey or don't, whether we love or whatever, uh, uh, blessings if we do. But with that obedience comes what? What did it mean for Joseph to obey? refused to lay with his master's wife. What, what did it mean for him? What did it mean for Jesus Christ? Death. Same thing. Yeah, it, he was taken from prison and judgment. So they condemned him to death for doing nothing wrong. Hmm. Yeah. So be a perfect witness on your job. I hope you'll have it tomorrow. <laughs> but don't worry, God has something for you to do. I, I experienced that in my own life. It was quite amusing, but serious. Anyway, so we're going to look at this. It says here, until the time that the word of the Lord tried him. So what does that mean? What does that word tried mean? The word of the Lord tried him. Joseph. The Tested. word of the Lord was what? Tested. Tested. Very good. What else? What's other synonyms? There's some other synonyms here. Tempted. Synonyms. Huh? Tempted. Tempted. Uh, we, it, it says Genesis 22.1. After these days, God tempted Abraham. To tempt Abraham about sacrificing his son Isaac. Was he tempting him to do evil? Was this a temptation to do evil? No, it's, it means a test. He was testing his servant. He knew that Abraham would pass the test. He gives, God gives us tests that we can pass. Okay. He's not a college professor. I don't think I could pass a test in college because I'll start out the first five questions will have woke answers, which I got that wrong. God gives us tests that we can pass. He's just. He's good. But, anyway, so a test. What's another word? For the word of the Lord tried him to test, to uh, tempt. What else? How about to prove him? Goes along with test. These are all synonyms. Uh, to refine him. That's what this word means. All of those things. And this also to refine him. Do you have to be refined? The, 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 the petroleum products, if you're going to run your car on gasoline, it has to be refined from a, from a smudgy compound. Right? Uh, so Refined means what? What does refined mean? Purify. To purify, which means negatively to get out the impurities, to remove the impurities. What does that imply? That there are always impurities in us, or that we encounter them in life and they 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 stick to us pretty well, as Hebrew says it laying aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. This is not unavoidable, except for one man, Jesus Christ. He did not have an Adamic nature. He had an Adamic body from his mother, but he did not have an Adamic nature, sin nature. However, Joseph did. And we sing in Joseph a very unusual man. Who, whose faith was given to him by God. I, the more I think about this, so, but even he needed to be refined. I would say, he's fine. But God looks on the heart. So let's go to, uh, well, let me just go on a little bit about Joseph, but we got to get to the next verses. I want to look at this word fine, refine today, to try. We're going to use this word try or try in the scripture and see how it is used 
whom it involved and how it is maybe should be true in your life. How long was Joseph in jail in prison? Years. Possibly. At least two. It says in, in, in Genesis chapter 40 that after two years, I mean, G Joseph says to the butler, when you get out of here, you're going to speak to Pharaoh. Tell him that I, you know, about, do something about it. Get me out of here. And it says the butler forgot him. Why did the butler forget him? <laughs> yes. After two years, he remembers. Ding! Oh, there was a Hebrew that interpreted my dream. The Pharaoh needed a dream interpreter. In due time. God's timing is perfect. Ours is not. So this is one of the conundrums we face. Because we want things done on time. Power. You can do a head roll on that one. God's going to do it in his time. So, he was in jail for at least two years. And as many as three years, I don't know exactly, it doesn't say. But I think his whole life, since it mirrors Jesus Christ, may mirror the ministry of Jesus Christ, was, was less than three years according to the Gospel of John. Now, no debates on this. You can believe what you want. But the, the point is, it, it's, it, God's painting a picture in, jo in Joseph's life, and he's painting a picture in your life. Uh, don't take the, the uh, frame off the easel. Don't try to get up there with your crayons and fill in the colors. <laughs> Besides, he's using a brush. So, so uh, he's in jail. What was the jail like? Where was the jail? Underneath Potiphar's. Underneath Potiphar's house. In, in, in Egypt. You know how hot it is in Egypt? I don't. I was never there, but I was in Jordan. Close enough. It's hot. All the time. It was in a cloud in the sky for the whole time I was there for a couple of those visits. Hot at night. The houses are like ovens. They're made of concrete. You know what concrete does? It absorbs heat during the day and keeps you warm. And <laughs> so he's in underneath. Did he have light down there? Were there windows? Fresh air? Had the ventilating system approved by the government? Were the climatologists active in Egypt? Can you th don't think about it, because if you have claustrophobia already, you'll panic. He couldn't. That was where God was. I can't explain this. When he got out, <laughs> he's in the dungeon ministering to the prisoners, cleaning, their, washing their feet. Well, Jesus washed some feet, didn't he? Washing their feet, taking care of them as a CNA would do in the nursing home, and, and treating their wounds and whatever else he was able to do, given the rain and the whole place left, and so forth. And, and, and I can't imagine what it would be like to even be there. But he did that, and then one minute, someone rushed in and said, get cleaned up. You're going to see Pharaoh. That's it. Now, this is after two years of going. It's like having given. <laughs> it would be like Paul and the people on the ship in, in the Adriatic. They'd given up all hope that they should be saved. So, what? 
boom, boom, boom. So he's shaved, he's clean, he's washed, he's got new clothes. Within, within an hour or less, he's, he's gone from the judgment to the throne room of the king. I think that's the meaning for Isaiah 53 of, of Jesus. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Without going into an explanation of that, one day Jesus is hanging on the cross. He says it's finished. Three days later, he's restored to the kingship. And 40 days after his resurrection, of course, physically restored as a man to the throne room of the king, right? So, wonderful. So, this is amazing. But, when Joseph is asked to advise the king about what's coming and what to do about it, if you read, the, read it in Genesis 41, what he said was very brief. He was a man discreet and wise. That means he, he didn't have to use a lot of words to say what was necessary. Nothing extraneous, nothing wrong, nothing foolish. This is amazing. And those few words that he said changed the future of Egypt and of Israel. And he never lost something that he gained in that prison. Humility. That you and I probably do not even come close to. What does it say in Philippians chapter 2 about Jesus. He, he humbled, himself. humbled himself. How many times? Every single moment of every single day in his life in order to minister to us here on this planet. You get what I'm saying? And even obedient to the death of the cross for sinners who could care less about him. Even we be blown to your sight. Correct? Mm -hmm. Or not. Whatever. Think about it. So this is quite amazing. So how do we see this? He brings his brothers. Okay, he's going to obey God. He's now going to submit himself. He's gonna, God is going to use this man to save Israel. I mean to rescue, to deliver Israel. And to make of them eventually a great nation in Egypt. And so he had, first of all, to bring them to repentance. Because he was discreet and wise, he knew how to do that. Now it's a story you can read it again in the last few chapters of Genesis. It's amazing. He had to, they had to come to realize and acknowledge their sin, their transgression against him and against the Lord and what they had done, and they did. And when he knew that, he revealed himself to them. What did he say? I'm Joseph. The one they suppose is dead is alive and standing before them. Isn't that going to happen in the future to the nation of Israel with Jesus of Nazareth? I am Jesus of Nazareth. What did he say to Paul? I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. I can imagine what was going through Paul's mind at that point. Yeah, amen. <clears throat> he might have thought about that verse in Genesis. I am Joseph. I am Jesus. The one who is now completely over their lives. I mean, he had the power to save them or put them to death, didn't he? Absolutely. No man could lift a hand in Egypt without Joseph. By the command of Pharaoh. So this is an amazing thing. So let's get into our the word study here. Uh, Job chapter 23. I'm just going to go through this in order in the scriptures and kind of follow this verse by verse through from book to book. Job chapter 23, we'll start with that. This is not ex it's exclusive, but these are the verses I've chosen. And we're going to look at that word uh, uh, chapter 
23, what we're looking at verse 10. But he knoweth the way that I take. Was Job a man who was familiar with suffering? When he was innocent of all charges, but he wasn't refined yet. Are you, are you with me? Do, do you get what I'm, well, I'm trying to see here. I'm trying to grab, I don't know how to say it. He wasn't refined yet. So, but anyway, uh, but he knoweth the way that I take when he hath, what? What does it say, Joseph? Until the time of his word came, the word of the Lord tried him. Did the word of the Lord try Job? What is that? When he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Keep this in mind. Uh, okay, let's go to Psalms. Get the book of Psalms, chapter 12. Now, you may make, make, make a comment. I'm limited to my time, of course, and I, I wanted to tell you that I can't help but tell a story of Joseph every time I tell it. So. It rocks me. So, 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 um, you may might want to make a comment or, or an observation. Please, just raise your hand and just say it. It's not an interruption. Psalm chapter 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord, oh, says, who wants to read this? Psalm 12, verse 6. The, nice words, the words of the Lord are pure words as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Okay, tried. Which means what? Refined. Correct. How do they refine silver? They bring it to a boiling point, which is really hot. And it, just as it, the, as it begins to bubble, the impurities come out on the top. They skim them off, cool it down a little bit, then do it again and again and again until there are no impurities left. Still, in this world, never going to be 100 percent sure. So, but this is the whole process that God has used. And this is this is the wonderful thing about His Word that we have in our hands. Uh, there's been a refining process involved in giving us this. Amen. Inspired by God for sure, but a process that has produced something unmatched in value. Next one, 66. Psalm 66. These two go together, so this is not exactly in order, but Psalm 66, verse 10, refers to the same process. Who wants to read Psalm 66, verse 10? Uh, what am I at here? Yes. Psalm 66, verse 10. Now he's talking about his people, particularly people of Israel. But that, does that apply to us in the churches? Absolutely, because we're joined to them. Next. Who's got it? 66 verse 10. Nice and loud. For thou, O God, hast proved us, thou hast tried us, as silver is tried. Mm -hmm. Now read verse 11 too, please, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Thou broughtest us into the net, thou hast thou latest affliction upon our loins. So does God use affliction to try us or the purifying methods? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do we like afflictions? No. Absolutely not. Well, you may. I do. <laughs> Got to skip the details. So the, the next one, go back to Psalm 18, verse 30. So Joseph was afflicted in that prison, was he not? But even before that, he was seriously afflicted and greatly injured by the transgression of his brothers who really, some of them wanted to kill him. <clears throat> but they couldn't, because God had a purpose in his life. And he ended up, wow. Okay, so 16, what, what has, Psalm 18, verse 30, who wants to read that? As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Wow. Why, sh why shouldn't we trust in him? His word has been proven 
to be pure long before we existed on the planet. Amen. So why don't we trust it all the time? Mm -hmm. Tell me that you do. That's okay. You may. Maybe, maybe you're better than Joseph. I don't know. It's a refining process. Amen to that. And it won't be finished until... When he returns, and we get our resurrection. The resurrection, exactly. It's not going to be over until the resurrection. Yeah. Count on it. I, I wish what I was telling you is not true. Because <laughs> yeah. I like to relax now. <laughs> okay, Psalm 105, we did that, verse 19. We know that, the word of the Lord tried him. Go to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8 and 9. Zechariah, last Second to last book in the Bible, on the Old Testament, I'm sorry. Zechariah chapter 13. I've read these. We, we did cover these, some of these, this scripture for sure. But let's go over it again. So this word, look where, it's amazing. It, it's amazing to me where this exact word is in these exact places. This is not a mistake. So these are warnings. So these are things... So the, the testing that was in Joseph's line in life and, and, and the purpose that he had in Joseph's life is a direct line to the word of God itself and therefore to Jesus. And then to, watch this, the New Testament times, including the churches. Now when did the New Testament begin? Christ died. When he died, he established the New Testament in the upper room. He established it in his blood, in the, the, taking the cup of the disciples in the upper room on the, on the preparation day, the same day that he was crucified. Because the following day, right? And it continues until the end of time and beyond. This is the everlasting covenant. Amen. So it is for Jews. First, and also to the Gentile, the Greek. We are included. Those of us who believe in the, the Hebrew Messiah are included in the Hebrew covenant that the Messiah made with them, the new covenant. I won't get into that. You can, uh, Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9, who wants to read that? Now watch this because uh, what's, hap what's happened to Israel recently is very tragic. And, and it's, I can't even walk, I can't go into the detail of it, but that's only a, a, a precursor of the tribulation period. Because they must come to faith in Christ and then be refined. God doesn't refine lost people. He, he convicts them and draws them, doesn't he? And there's a process to that for sure. Uh, anyway, someone read for me eight, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8. First, Julian? <coughs> tried and refined is here together so we're not making this up here and this is the this, this is how we find the definitions of these words in the scripture by comparing them to scripture it says here we find them and try them and so we looked at that process and that's what's going to happen and it's going to produce a new nation a regenerated nation a revived people a, a, a covenanted people who will be protected and kept by the Lord for a thousand years so that even at the end they lift not a weapon when the enemy attacks and they're destroyed with a fire. Isn't this amazing? 
Nobody can overthrow them. The Palestinians, well, some of them become believers. Amen. That's what you pray for, people to be saved. Because that's their salvation, that's their deliverance. It's not, they're not going to own the land of Israel. And it's not going to be divided. I don't care what any politician says. Amen. Want to divide the land of Israel? That's not going to work. I suggest they repent before trying. And just realize that the scripture is correct. And it's his land, not theirs or anybody else's. So here we go. Uh, we have some examples we could give of God trying people like Peter and Paul in their lives. And we have these in the scripture. You know, Peter confesses that Christ is that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and and then then he and then he uh, reproves the the Lord for going to the cross, which the Lord calls him Satan, but not really, but he's addressing Satan, and and so this is a very interesting thing. So this is the refining process in Peter's life, even as a believer, as a disciple of Jesus Christ, in in chapter eighteen. He's talking of asking the Lord about forgiveness. There is a refining process here because obviously Peter and we also have a problem with forgiving people. We're to forgive one another as God has forgiven us and bear no grudge against them. Amen. That's easy to say. It's a process. So a refining process. <coughs> For us, not the person you have to problem. <coughs> In John 21, lovest thou me more than the, oh, in, in chapter 26 of Matthew, where, where he's in the room and he denies the Lord. Okay, so all of this is a testing process. John 21, where afterward, after the resurrection, he asked Peter three times, lovest thou me more than me? <laughs> so this is a, a process is not going to end until the resurrection. So let's go right to the New Testament very quickly. It'll take a little extra time today. You don't mind. Uh, well, maybe I should stop right here, but let me at least go to. Uh, let's go to the Book of James. Back, and we're going to go back to talk about Job here, right back to the beginning, of where we started concerning Job. So, what's the key in all of this? What was the key in Joseph's life? What did he have to learn? What was the Lord doing in his life to bring about what he wanted with his nation, Israel? What is the key in your life? What is a very important thing and required of ministers of the gospel? What one word would we say is the Lord's object in refining a man or a woman? What is necessary? What is very difficult to achieve, especially in our day and time, which is a very rushed about world? Wouldn't you agree? If you don't, look in your rearview mirror when you're driving the speed limit. All you see is one headlight or two. And if it's a truck. That's a good point. Be holy for I am holy. Holy means without impurities, right? Being refined. It's, it, it's, yes, exactly. Very good. James chapter 1. Watch this. Verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. I'm still working on Knowing this, that the trying of your faith, are we talking about refining now? Mm -hmm. That the trying, remember it said to try, to test, to prove, to find, to refine. Know this, that the trying of your faith worketh what? That's, I think, the key. That's something where we have to, we have, that God wants to see in our lives. 
And other people need to see it too. Now I'm being very critical of me, not you. But is this, is this what it says? The trying of your faith worketh patience. So that's the object of the refining process. I believe and not only that, but let patience have her perfect work, complete work, that you may be perfect or complete. That doesn't mean faultless, complete, and entire, wanting nothing. Quote me Psalm 23, verse 1. I shall not want. And what does this verse say? You have to have patience to get there. Let your patience have a perfect, that you may be perfect in time. Wanting nothing. Be How? What's that? Be content in every state that you're in. Filipenses, cuatro. Right. Okay. Think about it. Where was Paul when he says this? Writes this. <laughs> in prison. In prison, in a dungeon where there was no light, heat, but to who knows what. I mean. I can't imagine, that's another fellow like Joseph, I can't imagine being like, but, okay. It's history. And it's the proof and evidence of God's love, but we're not finished with this quick, I'll just keep going here. Um, uh, and, and so, go to James chapter 5. And we'll, 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 we will reinforce this point about patience. And I, again, I don't say it by way of rebuke, but of a challenge, a challenge, you know. Uh, my neighbor has suffered many things in life. It's, it's not yet a believer, but, you know, he said to me, I take everything in life as a challenge. Well, that's the good, that's the right attitude, you know, and, and, and that helped me, uh, especially what I'm going through. But James chapter 5, verse 7 uh, be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. That's why the refining process is not going to end until the resurrection. Behold, the husbandman, the father, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until it received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord. Draw the mind. Wow. And uh, grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Confess your sins, they am your transgressions. Acknowledge these things. Confess that you're about as impatient as, as Jim Piragallo. Okay? And you know, you, you, you got a place, you got a good starting place there. All right? And, and so. Uh, it, it acknowledge of transgressions and forgives the iniquity of our sin takes it away. He's the Lamb of God. Only he can do that. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of what? Patience. That's why I say that's what God was doing in Joseph's life. Certainly a prophet talked about their going up back into Israel. That was exactly as it said. Verse 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. This is historic. That the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. So don't forget that when you're being afflicted. Don't forget that when your patience is being tried. And it will be tough. Some, it's a process, and you can get there. You can get to the finish line patiently, as Hebrews chapter 12 says, to run with patience the rest. I've never, as a runner, I never got, I wouldn't understand, how do you run with patience? But I, I can, I, there's an illustration, but I'll skip it. But the point is uh, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. He's standing at the finish line, cheering you on. He's got a prize for you when you cross so go to Proverbs chapter. There's some more here, but we'll maybe do it another time. Uh, just a few more verses in 1 Peter and Revelation, but go to Proverbs chapter 25.
five verse four so we read this and we'll conclude thank